Scripture reading comes from Philippians 3, 1 to 11. Turn in your Bibles. Electronic devices. <clears throat> Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, <coughs> rejoice in the Lord. <coughs> I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. You ever want to flip that in your mind when you're reading that Jesus Christ verses? Do that all the time. We put no confidence in human effort, though I have confidence in my own effort. I, anyone could indeed, if an awkward statement in the English coming from the Greek. Let me read it again. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable. Now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I could no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I became righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. The word of the Lord. So do you have an item that you deeply value? Uh, maybe a favorite album. Yeah, classic vinyl. Or maybe it's a CD. And for younger people out there, maybe it's an MP3 or 4. Maybe it's a signed copy of a book of, from your favorite author. Maybe you have a prized baseball card a memento from a special trip or an event. Some of you probably have a favorite car. We all have those, right? You have something that you consider highly valuable, right? You know, for me, I still have my trumpet from the fourth grade. It doesn't look very good, but still makes good music. I don't play it very often, but you know, it holds a special place in my heart. I still have the teddy bear my grandfather bought for me when he heard I was born and then personally delivered to Michigan from Philadelphia. And it still plays bronze lullaby. Like me, it's lost some of its hair, but it's special and it's important. Matter of fact, Teddy even has a few stitches in him. Life's been interesting for him. But we place value on things like that, don't we? All of us have something that we place value on, right? But there's other things that we place value on that go beyond physical possessions. We value an idea or a concept or a belief, a philosophical thought. Maybe it's a childhood learning. Maybe it's something in your background or your heritage. Maybe it's something like your education that you value. Or maybe it's your job, your career accomplishments. Maybe there's something that changed your life and you hold those moments very dear and very precious. We value our opinions too. We often hold them sacred. And at least some degree or another, don't we? Some of you are all thinking about that when we should see some smiles in that because I know some of you have some strong opinions. And you value them. 
And that's okay. So I have discovered that in religious tradition and circles, religious circles, we have those traditions that we value. We always believe in them. We think they are the best thing that happens in a church. And this is the way a church really should operate. So we hold those things sacrosanct. And when you ask to change those, the first question is change, change. We don't change in the church. We don't do change here. Everything's timeless. Can't do that. That's off limits. You can't interfere with that because we have placed high value on whatever it is. Change. But we have our traditions, don't we? Made me think of Tevia from Fitter on the Roof. Here the opening, he's talking about traditions, and he say, you may ask, how did this, tra this tradition get started? I don't know, but it's tradition. <laughs> he goes on to say, where would, we, where would we be without our traditions? And then he goes on just before they sing the song, Traditions. Because of our traditions, every one of us knows who he is and what God expects him to do. And that's how we operate with our religious traditions. We usually think of those sets of behaviors, rules, regulations that people are expected to follow. And, and some are unwritten, and some are codified in bylaws and policies of churches. In my, my, my first solo pastor job, there I am, we had had meetings, the deacons had told me their tradition of baptism and how we'd have roses and flowers and people would come down and I was doing a baptismal class with all the kids who had said they were ready to accept Christ. And, and just before I enter the baptistry, the one person leans over to me and says, you know, don't forget to give an altar call from the baptistry when you're done baptizing all the young people. Okay, so I did. And to the surprise of everyone in the church, Mike jumps up and comes running down forward, throwing his wallet behind him and his keys everywhere, kicking off his shoes. And I invite him down to the baptistry, and we baptized him. Shortly after I got out of the baptistry, one of the deacons came up to me and said, by the way, Pastor Worth, when I said you give an altar call, you're supposed to thank him for coming forward, arrange a baptismal class, and some 10, 12, 16 weeks later, we do another baptism because we make sure he goes through all the class. And I'm like, he's there, there's water, what's a pastor to do? <laughs> I served another church where there were some unwritten rules. Ladies were not allowed to wear slacks in church, supposedly. They always had to wear a dress or a skirt, and they should always have their heads covered. And the men on a hot and muggy summer day in a building that had no air conditioning, they couldn't wear shorts. And by the way, you were really out of touch if you didn't wear a tie every Sunday morning, gentlemen. By the way, the men weren't, it wasn't held against the men when they forgot to wear their ties, which most of them did. But the ladies were held accountable because it was a rule. You know, and we place value on things like that. And those are behavioral traditions. Like the person who says, you know, if you don't really pray three hours every day in your morning devotions, you really aren't spiritual. But maybe the most spiritual thing I do is just sit with my cup of coffee in the presence of the living God and do nothing. Some of the holiest moments of my life have been in those moments. But we listen to all those rules and regulations and those traditions and we start accepting them and we ingrain them into our patterns and we start to tell others how to do it. We start to respond to that. So we can laugh about this. And we can have, I mean, I can come up with several more of these that would just make you roll all in the aisles today. But the reality is we have a problem when we impose another set of behavioral expectations or rules or regulations on someone else to determine just how committed they are to following Jesus Christ. 
See, the implication is that if you follow these rules and regulations, you can be confident that your Christian life is what God wants. Now, if you disagree with any of these and you publicly voice your disagreement, well, some of us are going to just back away from you for a little bit. We're going to put some distance. And if there's anybody else in the church that happens to agree with you, well, we're going to distance ourselves from them. And what starts happening is you become the church of us versus them. And all of a sudden, you start having division and disunity. Then you have church split or church fight. And by the way, that was exactly what was happening in the church of Philippi. A group of teachers visiting from Jerusalem had arrived, and they were pressuring in their teaching the Gentile believers in Philippi to adopt a particular set of rules and, resurrect, rules and regulations that Jewish Christians held to be valuable. They were teaching Gentile Christians in order to be the best Christian possible. You needed to live a Jewish lifestyle. They insisted that the male Philippian followers of Christ be circumcised. They insisted that the women and the men follow all the rules of the Old Testament, that they would celebrate the Jewish holidays, the fasts. They would perform the ritual washings. These Jewish Christians were communicating to Gentile Christians. It's wonderful that you Gentiles believe in Jesus Christ and you're saved. But if you really fully want to please God and be on the right page with God, you just have to follow all these ancient guidelines. You know, God gave them to his Old Testament people. So, you know, you need to keep the dietary laws. You need to observe the Sabbath. You need to follow the religious calendar. And most of all, to show that you're really committed, gentlemen, that you're a true believer, you have to be circumcised. Bottom line is this. If you want to be confident of your spiritual life, then these are the things that matter, and these are the things that you need to do. And this was causing disunity in the church. Paul had already been stressing and teaching us, right, that the Holy Spirit is working in us to complete our salvation, to bring it to full maturity in Christ so that the world can see what it looks like when Jesus Christ lives in someone and changes their life and picks them up and carries them through the hell of life. Amen. He's been saying you need to have one mind and one purpose. You need to have mutual love for one another. You need to care and put the interests of others first. And these Jewish Christians were coming in focused on the external behaviors, what people could see, the religious habits, the physical signs. And they were willing to say that another Christian was wrong because they weren't subscribing to the proper set of rules. And by the way, that's still an issue today in the church. Because we get caught up evaluating people by their externals all the time. Do we ever really sit down with them and learn their heart? Find out what God is doing in their life? Great illustration was I was in college and we were on break. And my one roommate, there were a bunch of us, we had all taken a break together at our one roommate's house. And he decided he wanted to see if he could connect with a girl from high school. And he says, that, you know, their, their church that she attends does a Sunday night service, and I know her family always goes, let's go. So I'm in a Christian college. We're all there. Oh, sure, why not? Let's go to church. So we go. We're college. Our hairs are down to our shoulders, and we're wearing blue jeans and polo shirts that were open and sneakers and just, you know, just college attire. It was the 70s. And so we're there, and... There was good music, and we hear the sermon, and there was an altar call at the end. Typical Baptist fashion, the preacher was put in high-pressure sail. And this wonderful little kid, about nine, ten years old in front of us, in his navy blue suit with a nice red tie and his glasses, turns around and looks at all of us and says, Would you boys like to accept Jesus Christ today? He had been raised with an expectation that we all noticed when we walked in the room. 
we were the only males that had long hair. Everybody else had crew cuts because that was the holy thing to do. I actually had a recruiter for a college tell me that. Well, you can't attend our school if you're going to wear your hair like that. You're going to have to get a crew cut. Because really spiritual people wear their hair short when they're men. And I'm just trying to figure out, well, how would that play with Jesus, who lived in the Middle East, who probably had long hair well longer than mine? And again, we can laugh at those things, but think about how often we do those things to people. When we say, this is the only translation of the Bible you can read, or this is the only way you can pray, or this is the only way you can say the right words to make sure you've accepted Jesus Christ. We impose those ideas on everybody else. We do. Paul says to watch out for people who stress that. He says they're actually evil. He calls them dogs. Because the Jewish Christians had already forgot the lessons of the Old Testament. The lesson of the Old Testament was that God always looks at the heart, not the externals. And we go to the story of David. God has told Samuel, Saul, he's just not cutting it as the godly king. And we're going to replace him with my anointed. So you're going to go over to Jesse's house, and Jesse's going to bring his boys out, and you're going to anoint one of them. And Jesse brings all his older boys out, and boy, they're handsome, they're strapping, six-pack abs, big biceps, girls swooning over them. And they look like warriors. And Samuel says, is it him? No. Is it him? No. Is it him? No. Is it him? No. And God has to finally say to him, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God is in the heart business. And the problem the Israelites had, the problem the Jewish Christians had, and dare I say some of us have, is not rooted really in the externals or the rules and regulations or the physical signs of our faith. For circumcision was a sign of the covenant of the Old Testament. The problem is the degree, the high degree of confidence that we put in those externals that says if we are doing these externals, we are right with God. And so we measure everybody by the externals, the rules and the regulations. It came to the point that they really felt that their salvation by doing all these things was secure before God, even though their hearts had drifted far away from God. And they were worshiping truly other gods. They may look good to others. And that's the problem we have because sometimes we deceive ourselves into thinking that because our behavior or our physical appearance looks good, that we're okay when our heart is truly sick. The outward signs of your faith should flow out of the deeper heart commitment that we have made to God. The outward life, the one that everyone sees that should be shining brightly, should be a reflection of the inward change that is taking place in your life as your relationship with God grows deeper and the Holy Spirit is continuing to work out your salvation to the glory of God. See, what Paul is saying is we are to rely on Jesus. We are to put no confidence in the flesh. We are to put no confidence in our abilities to save ourselves or even to please God. Those religious habits, those externals, those traditions are man-made. What we desperately need is to allow God to change our hearts. And I love this verse from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 30. The Lord your God will change your heart and the hearts of all your descendants so that you will love him with all your heart and soul and so you will live, or you may live. God's in the heart business. Paul put it this way, for we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. The Bible has always talked about the circumcision of the heart. As you go through the Old Testament, God repeatedly says, you may be physically circumcised, you may be my descendants, you may be people who call yourself mine, but you are worshiping other gods, your heart is far from me, and you need to have a circumcision of the heart to get right with me. 
Paul goes on to say, we rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us, so we put no confidence in human effort. The defining characteristic that God looks for us in, in us is already present when we pledged our allegiance to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and we agreed to follow him. The Holy Spirit has moved in. There's no set of rules and regulations that we have to observe to have confidence before God. Because our confidence before God comes from living in Christ and everything that Christ did at Calvary and in resurrection. There are no rules and res regulations that are necessary to be accepted by him. The way we are accepted by God is by faith and belief in Jesus Christ alone. You see, what Paul is saying is we have the Spirit of God to lead us. Paul says there in verse 3 that Christ is all we need. All we need to please God, to be righteous in God's eyes. We glory in Christ. We rejoice in him. We define ourselves in Christ. Because he's all we need. Our identity, who we are, is bound up in him. And so therefore, we should put no confidence in the flesh or the external activities because nothing else is needed for God's approval. Because by the way, Jesus' blood has covered it all. And all we have to do is have faith. It's taken me years to fully understand this. I started to count the years last night and gave up. Because the reality is I spent years trying to do all the right things, listening to what people said, read all the right books, and I was looking good before others. People would say nice things, but you know, something was wrong inside of me. Something felt missing. I may have been looking good to those on the outside, and I was enjoying the recognition, but I didn't feel the presence of God, to be truthful. And I certainly know I didn't have the power of God operating in my prayer life. Paul warns us not to let others tell us how to adopt a lifestyle, which was what I had been doing. If you want to be truly spiritual, don't adopt others' practices. Build your own in a relationship with God. You may pick up a few things, by the way, from other people that will benefit you and help you, but they become tools in your toolbox. They shouldn't be the driving force of what you're doing in your relationship with God. Don't let them tell you that certain particular religious practices or rules will give you pleasure before God. Do you know what really pleases God? Do you know what really pleases God? The sacrifice you desire, the psalmist writes, is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. What God doesn't reject and what pleases them is when someone understands that they're broken and they need something to help them in life and they cry out to God and they call out to God with a heart that's saying, I want to go in a different direction. The psalmist also continues, he says, he takes no pleasure in the strength of a horse or in human might. God doesn't take any pleasure in all the things that we think are successful. No, the Lord's delight is in those who fear him, those who put their hope in his unfailing love. Catch the difference? When we place on externals, we're using other things to please God. But what God wants is your belief and your hope that his love can sustain you, his faithful love can carry you. His love will change your life. Because Paul says in Ephesians, right? That's because of his great love for you that while you were dead in your sins, he made you alive again in Christ Jesus. And by the way, your faith pleases God. Hebrews tells us it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Your faith pleases God. You can never find pleasure in God's eyes without faith. By the way, all those externals, those rules, those regulations that we so, the traditions that we so often rely on, don't need faith. 
All they need is human effort. What pleases God truly is a heart willing to surrender, willing to go in a different direction, that is willing to live in his presence every moment of every day because we are allowing the Holy Spirit to change our heart, to truly align our heart with God's heart. God is pleased when we live in a relationship with him because we have a change of heart. That's what strokes heaven's gates. That's what excites heaven. And I'm just, I just love this. I'm with Paul because in verse 1, he states, you know, I never get tired of telling you this, these things. And I do it because I safeguard your faith. The reason why I repeat faith stories of my life, the reason why we have others telling you faith stories, their stories, is because we are here to guard your faith so you understand one thing, that Jesus Christ is all you need and he'll carry you. Jesus Christ is the one who saves you, redeems you, and loves you. We want to strengthen your faith. So no matter how bad the world acts, no matter what the world says about the church, like, you know, those Christians, all God is is a crutch for them. Well, give me two of them. Because it's all about Jesus. Paul moves on to his own experiences. Uh, he's really saying, here's what I used to be. I have been there where they are. I understand the cultural mindset of those Jewish Christians because for years I depended on those same behaviors to make me pleasing to God. And the truth is, I did it better than all those turkeys. I was that good. Paul tells his story, how he once valued the externals, the proper credentials to earn him favor. He said, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was born into the faith because I'm a descendant of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day, according to the law. So let's just talk about that for a second because that lineage is very impressive. Jewish people would have been caught right onto that culturally of that day. For the tribe of Benjamin was highly respected and highly valued. You see, the only son of Jacob that was born in the promised land that God was going to give them and gave them was Benjamin. The first king of Israel came from the tribe of Benjamin. Do you know where the holy city of Jerusalem sits? In the territory that was given to Benjamin. Let's extend it out a little further for us. Do you know where the Savior was born? In the town of Bethlehem, in the territory of Benjamin. So he says, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. My lineage is impressive. I spoke the language. I kept the customs. I didn't let the secular culture compromise me or corrupt me. I adhered to the behaviors, Paul says, that few could match because I was a Pharisee. I studied the Old Testament as carefully as anyone could. And then I tried to implement those things in my life. I did everything that was required of me. And not only that, among the group of Pharisees, no one was more committed than me. No one could be a Pharisee better than me. No one was more passionate about it or active. I wanted to preserve the Jewish heritage, the ancient faith. I did everything I could to rid us of those heretics. I was so zealous for God that I persecuted them and went around the cities everywhere as I could go to arrest them and bring them back to trial. According to all human standards, I, Paul, was beyond reproach. I was blameless. I obeyed the law fully and completely. I thought all these things were valuable. I believed my efforts, my beliefs, my zealousness, how I lived for God were precious and priceless. You see, if anyone could have earned God's favor by their external behavior and their adherence to the law and the regulations, he says, I would have done it and it would have been me. 
Paul was without fault with respect to righteousness that comes by obeying laws. Paul believed that his efforts would someday make him stand before God and be considered by God as having successfully made it. Paul valued all those efforts. He defended them with so much passion that he persecuted followers of Jesus Christ. But one day, suddenly, as he was off to persecute some more Christians and earn brownie points, he and Jesus had a personal one-on-one conversation. And there, laying on the ground, being knocked off his horse, he and Jesus had that talk. And Paul says, I came to understand that everything that I value, that I held precious, is truly worthless. It's unable to stand the test. It's actually reprehensible when compared to what Christ has done for me. And that really, my friends, is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. When suddenly you realize that all you thought was valuable, all you thought you could do to please God, does not compare with what Jesus Christ has done for you in his love and dying for you and saving your soul. Amen. Nothing compares to what Jesus has accomplished for you. It's in that moment that you realize all your efforts and the hard work to gain God's favor have truly failed. All the gains you thought you were making the self-satisfaction, the pride of spiritual, religious accomplishments are nothing more than a pile of rotting trash. All those things that we do on our own strength to draw us closer to God are worthless compared to living in a relationship with Jesus. To know Jesus as Lord, as Messiah, the one who is given and will give you a fresh start to your life is beyond comprehension. We really can't comprehend the depth, width, height, and breadth of God's love. Matter of fact, knowing Jesus and living in a relationship with Jesus is so wonderful, so precious, that Paul says, I will discard everything else I'll treat everything else as filth, as stinking garbage. I will throw it all away for the sake of knowing Jesus, my Lord. I want Jesus more than I want anything else. I want Jesus more than everything else that I once valued and held dear. I desire Christ to live in me and become one with me more than anything else. I want that oneness, that unity we find. To be one with Jesus, united in a thriving relationship, so that the power that raised Jesus from the dead will flow through me. That's my heart's desire. Nothing compares to knowing Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. And the truth is, when we allow anything to be more valuable than Jesus, we have a problem. When we allow others to impose their religious methodology, their rules, their regulations as a true way to find God, we truly miss out on a life with God and what it means to live in that life, the potential of what it can be. In the end, we truly miss out on the real relationship, the real righteousness that comes from walking in faith with Jesus, where our faith keeps growing and our righteousness keeps growing. When we look to rules and regulations and traditions to be our guide, we have taken our eyes off Jesus and the real life that Jesus is offering. I know I tried. I thought I could make it. And here's what I discovered, like Paul. I discovered that when I was doing my own thing, following the man-made rules, listening to what other people were saying, 
uh, caving into their peer pressure of setting standards for me of how I should be as a Christ follower. My heart had drifted far from God. Oh, I could come to church and I could sing the hymns with gusto and I could pray and I could read scripture and I could even preach some sermons. But the reality is something is lost in here. My heart was far from God. And in that place, spiritual vitality was sagging. If you're there, you know you feel the frustration, the powerlessness, the defeat, the wondering. I asked, where is the joy the Bible talks about? Because there was no joy in Mudville. Where is the peace that Jesus says when he says, my peace I give you, my peace I leave with you? Got to the point where I was saying, where are you, God? Where are you? See, in that place, others are thinking you look good and you measure up to their expectations, but there's truly an emptiness in your life, a shallowness that eats away at your soul. Everything you thought you were gaining is nothing more than rubbish to be hauled away. Because what's missing is a heart that loves Jesus, that is deeply in love with Jesus. And isn't that what Jesus called the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. There's no gain in self-driven faith, only worthless trash. Because true righteousness is not found in keeping rules, but rather from a relationship with Jesus who loves you beyond your human comprehension. Paul put it this way. I no longer count my own righteousness through obeying the law, but rather I become righteousness through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Reality is you must believe that Jesus is more valuable than everything else. You must believe that Jesus has the answers to life, that Jesus is more important than your religious traditions and your religious rules. By the way, Jesus is more important than what your grandma taught you about how you do church. Jesus is more important. And you must believe that Jesus loves you and he wants to enter into a relationship with you, that he desires that the two of you become one, united, just like he and the Father and the Holy Spirit are united in one. Because that's his great prayer of unity for us, that we fall in love with Jesus so much and we allow the Holy Spirit to work out our salvation in us so that we become one with God that we become one with one another. It's you and Jesus. It's me and Jesus together in all kinds of weather, in every circumstance of life. That is far, far better than anything else. Because nothing compares to being in love with Jesus. Nothing compares with walking in his presence every day. Nothing compares to the comforting hug in a moment that you need it from the living God because you are spending time in his presence. And by the way, I've discovered that, you know, since I've been working on that relationship thing, and I haven't mastered it by far because I think it's a lifetime journey. I've hit some hard times in life and I wonder what was going to happen and all of a sudden God's hugging me and I just know, well, thanks God, I needed that. <laughs> I didn't have to beg for it, didn't have to ask for it because we're in a relationship together. And he's working in my life and I'm learning to listen and obey. There's nothing compared to Jesus. You know, I was under the mistaken belief that I get all these degrees down this education, I'll be smarter than everybody else in the room, and I can lead a church. And boy, was I an arrogant <coughs> person. And what I've learned is that they're just tools in the toolbox. The real power is allowing the Holy Spirit to move in your life, that you develop a relationship with God that is so transforming and so changing, that his presence is always with you, and then you discover that all of a sudden there is power to overcome anything in life. 
because Jesus is better than everything else. He is beyond compare to everyone else. And that's really what I like about the music group Jesus Culture's song, The Holy Spirit. We've sung it before, you know the words. There's nothing worth more that'll ever come close. Nothing compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetness of love. When my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. The undoing of that shame that they talk about, that shameful feeling, is not found in any effort that you can do, but is found in a person named Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the one who loves you. He's inviting you to be into a relationship with him, to enter into a relationship with him, where true righteousness is found as your faith grows and thrives. Nothing compares to knowing Jesus. Today, will you put Jesus above everything else? Will you start setting aside some of those things, those other gods that have been derailing you and occupying your mind and keeping you from knowing what it's like to have the presence of God fill you completely? Because I'm telling you here, you'll never regret it. You'll never regret giving your life to Christ. Because knowing Jesus is far, far better than anything else this world has to offer. Jesus is far, far better than anything that you can create in your own mind or that we collectively can create in our traditions. Because nothing compares to knowing Jesus Christ. Everything else is nothing more than rubbish to go to the dump, to rot and be buried. Will you let Jesus be above everything else in your life? Would you declare today that he's preeminent, the number one, above everything else for your life and believe it in faith and the Holy Spirit will move in you? And he'll continue to work out that salvation in you. Because nothing compares to knowing Jesus. Nothing compares. Father God, I just thank you for bringing us here to this moment in this letter to the church at Philippi where we understand that nothing really compares, no matter how hard we try, nothing compares to what you were doing in us and what you have already done, Jesus, for us. We thank you for what you've accomplished on the cross. And Lord, right now, speak to us. Move our hearts. Stir us. That we would remember to put you above everything else. And so, Father, for your glory, would you change our lives and make us more like your son, Jesus. In the name of Christ.